The Canadian Public Servant Tony Turner was suspended from work and placed under investigation for having written and performed the song Harbour Man. His voice was silenced for eight weeks and he was unable to speak about the incident. Now his voice can be heard. I didn't know Tony until I showed up there at uh, Jill's Hootenanny on May Day. One of the gratifying things is just the personal connection with a, a guy like Tony who's a very sweet fellow and not really that political. You know, I'm amazed that he came up with the song he came up with because he's, as I said, not a very partisan person. My primary interest is, is songwriting, you know, and, and to be a, a political activist uh, or it is really kind of foreign to me. You know, I, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that wouldn't even put up a lawn sign, you know, in previous elections. And, uh, but I'm cast in this role uh, of uh, being the kind of spokesperson for this, not just for me as a songwriter, but for the whole, this whole community. And, and, uh, uh, and that is a, uh, it's a daunting thing, responsibility to take on, but it's also a responsibility that I can't ignore. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that I, uh, uh, that's one of the reasons that I, that I left the government early. So, so I could speak and I could be a champion for, for people who see me as a, as a spokesperson for this, for this, this cause. Uh, I was actually at the Grassroots Festival when uh, it was first performed publicly. Uh, there was a competition, a songwriting competition, uh, that I had actually prepared a song for as well. Um, and uh, then the four finalists, of which I wasn't one, uh, performed their songs at the Grassroots Festival, and this was Tony's uh, song was performed there as well. And it immediately drew quite an enthusiastic response from the whole crowd, all of us there, thought, hey, this is a pretty cool song. Mm -hmm. Partly because he uh, had articulated in the verses in such a, a, a thorough way so many of the things that have concerned many of us about the present government. Who controls our parliament? Harbour man, harbour man. Who squashes all dissent? Harbour man, harbour man. The Duffy hand out no respect for environment. Harbor Man, it's time for you to go. That was a really fun day when we shot the video for Harbor Man. And it was very short notice. We just kind of decided pretty last minute, hey, let's do this. What's the time we can do it? Oh, Friday at 2? Okay, let's see who's available. And those people, you know, we contacted a bunch of people. Those people showed up. Andrew told them how important it is to radiate a positive vibe. And, you know, he gave a little speech ahead of time. It's time to shed your inhibitions. It's time to show joy. And you know how you do it? You open your mouth and you show your teeth and you laugh and you jump up and down. And when you're singing, I want you to get right into it. And the more, the better. Show that rhythm. Show your joy and it'll come across. That is the important thing when you're singing this song. Harper Man, it's time for you to go! But this is what people re respond to. Smiling, happy, positive, joyful. And that comes through big time in the video. It's really, really nice to see it and to feel that energy, that positive energy. That can be extrapolated into all of our other situations, let's bring that positive energy and that hope and that togetherness, mm -hmm. that joy, let's bring that to what we do and let's get change happening that way rather than attack ads mm -hmm. <laughs> or you know, denouncing whatever program or person or instilling fear. Let's get away from that. Let's, let's operate on a whole new basis that's outside that entire context. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really fun day, shooting the video. And, you know, people, these are in general not professional singers. They're just people that love the song, love the message, love the energy, and wanted to contribute in some way. And so they did. <laughs> it's been really nice to see. I got an email um, asking if I would c come out and sing on a Friday afternoon, 2 o'clock. And let's face it, the number of people who are available during the week and mid-afternoon are, are not that many. So 
it means that a lot of older people, retired people, were the ones who sang the original song when, when, they, when they did the recording. When I was asked to sing it, I said, well, what's, what is it? And I had a look at the lyrics, and I thought, these are fantastic lyrics. They're very catchy. They're very clever. I listened to a version that um, uh, Tony Turner had recorded on YouTube, and I thought, that's catchy. I am all over this. I was quite um, pleased when he said to me, will you sing a verse? And uh, I said, yeah, I'd love to. And he said, uh, well, which one? And I said, well. Who's the rogue in Parogue? Harper Man, Harper Man. Whose party line must be towed? Harper Man. The proroguing of Parliament has been a tactic that the Conservatives have used to either delay or totally take bills off the table. Things have progressed through Parliament and suddenly they could just erase them. And then the second part of that verse I really liked, um, who won't buy into climate change until it's sold on the stock exchange, because I really feel that we have not been good environmental stewards. Uh, well, this was one I had to work out initially, I think, because, I mean, I've never been enamored with, with the Prime Minister. Um, and, you know, it took, I was, uh, uh, as you know, I took a, uh, like, a information from an article that was in a social justice newsletter as a starting point. You know, there was about a dozen things that, that were listed that Harper had done to undermine democracy in Canada. I took that and I expanded it. And I started thinking of other things, that things that I didn't like about the decisions that had been made by the Prime Minister or the, uh, the direction the country was going and the, the, the things he's ignoring about our environment or the, or the uh, uh, you know, social issues. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole thing about security is, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. I just, uh, all those things that really bothered me, I just, I just tapped into and uh, I, I put down on paper. So. That's, that's how it came together. Yeah. I'm, I'm just personally delighted that uh, people have found it interesting and enjoyed it as much as those of us who heard it the first time uh, did. Uh, I think that the, what the song brings out is, uh, is a whole litany of, of missteps by the present government and, I, and I'm quite, I'm no longer a public servant, I'm entitled to an opinion. <laughs> and in fact, I think I was entitled to an opinion while I was a public servant as well. And that's part of the issue, I guess, uh, that's, that's before uh, Tony right now and, and that needs to be sorted out. Is he entitled to express his opinion in a song like this? And, and I, I think, uh, I can't see how it would possibly interfere with his work, so why not? Uh, but uh, anyway, I, I just think it's a great song and a great fun and a wonderful political commentary. You know, it's kind of in the tradition of someone like Pete Seeger, mm -hmm. uh, who wrote a song like Where Have All the Flowers Gone, you know, in the middle of uh, the Viet Vietnam War. I mean, that's, that is such a powerful message. And to have that resonate with people is, is incredible. So in my own small way, even though I view Harper Man as, I, I've told many people it's a disposable song that I hope I don't have to sing after October 19th. Um, it has that same kind of resonance um, in, in, I suppose, a more, um, in the more angry tradition of, of folk songs, but I have an equal number of songs that are on them more uh, on the unity side and, uh, and things that speak of our own humanity. So, you know, it all balances out, I guess. It has really had a kind of a resonance with Canadians and it's given them a language to articulate all of the things that the Harper government has screwed up on mm -hmm. over the past 10 years. And there's a long list of things where they've really run counter to what I consider Canadian values to be. Um, and it gives people a, a quick list, a summary with a, a catchy tune, and uh, suddenly pe people are saying, oh yeah, that too. At the time, it never occurred to us that there would be any reprisals against Tony. Mm -hmm. Tony is a full-fledged, highly respected singer-songwriter, member of our music community here in Ottawa, and has been for years and years. He's been involved in all kinds of events. He's just about to release his third CD. He's written songs on all kinds of subjects. 
beautiful songs, great songs, circle of songs, an anthem of hope, and peace, and joy, right? And lots of other great songs. He's told people stories that couldn't tell their own stories. He's written love songs. He's written silly songs. And he wrote a really, really cool protest song that all it did was give a list of facts and say, this has got to end, the logical conclusion, right? I'm telling you, never for one second, never occurred to me, or I don't think any of us, that Tony Turner would be suspended from his job as a researcher of migratory birds <laughs> for eight weeks so far to be investigated for the crime of having expressed his opinion in a totally different domain that had nothing to do with his job. We got a letter indicating that he was placed, uh, he was being suspended with pay while he was being investigated because of, I think there were certain lines in the, um, in the video or in the song, you know, um, won't buy into climate change until it's sold on the stock exchange. I mean, these are artistic, li this is artistic license. It's artistic expression. Uh, I, mean, I mean, he's a singer singing. I mean, to think that this is a, a logical argument is a, is a bit much. But clearly, it, since he works for the Department of the Environment, they took it a bit personally, I think. In, yeah, in the initial letter in, in uh, the allegations, they had uh, they had, they had quoted parts of the song that they, they felt were, I guess, uh, uh, that bothered them, you know, I guess, uh, no respect for the environment, uh, who's a two-bit controlling freak, you know. Um, there were other lines, and at first they tried to link them to the work that I was doing, the ones that seemed to be sort of connected with the environment, and then other times they were just um, other just things that, that were embedded in the song, and uh, it, I, I, I just felt it was a weak argument to be pulling out parts of the song that had nothing to do with, to my view, of the, of the allegations. I mean, I don't know, because um, the allegations in the end dealt with posting. It wasn't so much the content, it's the posting of this stuff that was, maybe they needed to prove that it was uh, that uh, it was really anti, it was really fla inflammatory, and it was it was you know overtly political. I don't know, but I have a right to do that, as far as I'm concerned. I had the right to do that. So uh, it's uh, it's just like it's just part of history. <laughs> it's it's uh, the well, it was uh, I guess it was about. maybe 12 or 13 days before it hit the press. Uh, and we knew that it was going to come out in, in the press about a week after he got the suspension letter through a very interesting series of coincidences. But, uh, you know, when we got the letter from, or when he got the letter from Environment Canada, um, we had no idea what was going to be in it. And so I think Tony was very shocked. Um, I certain, but we certainly at that point never dreamed that it was going to blow up in the media the way that it did, and that the song was going to, as a result, really go viral. That that was still completely unexpected. Yeah, yeah. We just thought, well, okay, you know, we'll we'll go through the process with Environment Canada, and uh, uh, you know, the first thing that I said to, said to him was, call your union because you don't want to be dealing with that kind of interaction with your employer by yourself. Mm -hmm. And the union, I have to say, has been wonderful. They've been amazing. Suddenly hit the news that Tony Turner had been suspended. And I thought, what for a song? A song that simply reports the news. A song that's factual all the way through. Every single line of that song you've seen in newspaper reports, you've seen in magazines, you've seen documentation. So there was no untruth. So why was he being fired? Or, or suspended, I should say. He was being suspended to silence him. He sang out courageously. <laughs> and, you know, for us, this was all just part of what was happening in our world. Hey, let's make a video of this cool song and put it out there and hope it has, does some good. We never for a second thought that Tony was going to be punished in the way that he's being punished for doing this and harassed and intimidated and threatened and surveilled. 
Yeah, and stressed out, big time, as anybody would be when you've got the government of Canada on your case. Well, it's, I guess it was a bit surreal. I mean, we were sort of shocked to get that letter of, uh, you know, putting me on leave. And then the fact they couldn't, wasn't allowed to speak with uh, other people, people, uh, employees at Environment Canada, some of, many of whom are my friends. Uh, you know, that was even worse. So I felt like I was kind of a, uh, under house arrest basically here. And, um, yeah, it felt, it felt, it, it felt odd, you know, but I really wanted to resolve the situation. That was kind of my focus. I thought I, I, I wanted to cooperate with the officials, get my story straight. Even if it was different from their story, I wanted, I wanted to be, um, be sure that I, that I, you know, that I was saying the right things to the, to the, to the inquiry and informing it. Um, with my side of the story, and um, it didn't really change their side, their their perspective, unfortunately. But that was my focus at the time was to, was to uh, uh, get get it resolved as quickly as possible. As they had you know, they indicated in their initial letter that that it would be dealt with, the situation would be dealt with uh, thoroughly and expeditiously. And um, okay. so I, I took the, I took them at their word, um, and so I was really keen to, to cooperate with, with them at that point. But uh, as time went on, uh, you know, it, now eight weeks um, going in, I decided that was, uh, you know, I, I couldn't make a meaningful contribution to the project I was working on. And uh, I felt that they were just trying to keep sidelining me until the election was over. Uh, and maybe even until I retire. And I, I felt I needed to be a voice to speak, I needed to speak out, and uh, people were inviting me to sing places and uh, be a champion for for a cause, a political cause that um, they really that really was important to them, and they felt that the song, uh, you know, uh, was a uh, was a the song was a way for them to rally around uh, their feelings for the leadership in this country. Well, you know, uh, the further away um, the press gets from actually talking to Tony, the less accurate the reports become. And uh, there have been quotes by, uh, by media uh, uh, from people that they've spoken to that say that Oh, he's crossed over the line, you know. He's he's um, he shouldn't have done that as a public servant. And to me, that represents people who really haven't looked at any of the guidelines because it's fairly clear that uh, that he didn't break any guidelines at all. And um, uh, you know, so they are going down the wrong path because. And and I guess you could call it just um, maybe a lack of proper research on their parts to, to know. They, they don't seem to know what they're talking about. Yeah. I don't want to name names. No, no. <laughs> but yeah, and, and a, lot of, a lot of the reports have said that, uh, that he set up the website, that he set up the sing-along, that you know, he had nothing to do with any of that. It was Chris and Andrew. Basically, the Public Service Employment Act uh, outlines some of the conditions that limit the public servant's political rights. Uh, it, 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 it lays out three levels of, uh, of conditions under which one's uh, freedoms can be limited. Mm -hmm. And it depends on, of course, your visibility and your access to power. Like the, the closer you are to uh, the master, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the more restricted your capacity to express yourselves uh, becomes. So there's a level of action, uh, access to power, and there's also the relevance, right, of your work to whatever it is you're expressing your opinion about. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and the Public Service Commission has been mandated to be the gatekeeper of what con constitutes acceptable political activity versus unacceptable political activity. And all of that is based on a Supreme Court decision from 1991, uh, where basically uh, the Supreme Court decided that when you become a public servant, you do not stop being a citizen, right? Basically, that's in a nutshell what it meant. And therefore, as a citizen, you have the right to express yourself, and even politically, 
to belong to a party, mm -hmm. to provide you know, even funding. Uh, and there are activities of political nature that are more or less visible. So that's another uh, consideration to be taken into account. Well, you know, to me, the essence of, of the whole problem with Environment Canada um, is that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms it passed as part of the Constitution Act in 1982, gave public servants the same rights as all other Canadians uh, to f have freedom of expression. And um, it, that was supported by the Supreme Court in 1991. So I think the Union put it beautifully um, when they indicated that there was no conflict because of those legal precedents and because of the charter. So in the Osborne case, the issue was legislation which in effect involved a general ban on federal civil servants being involved in partisan politics, you know, period, during an election. I mean, it was just a general ban. And what the court said is, you know, well, of course there are, there, there are there have to be limits of some kind, the involvement of civil servants and partisan politics, but this is way too sweeping. This is way too general. And that's, and this takes back to what I was mentioning before, that's when the court said, um, we need to look at different factors. We need to consider somebody's, um, how high they are up in the public administration. We need to consider whether they are involved in significant po policy advice. We need to consider whether they exercise significant discretionary power or authority. And um, we also need you know, to, to consider what exactly they say, the tone they, they, uh, you know, the tone which they take you know, uh, when they address these issues. But generally speaking, civil servants uh, uh, who are not in the highest positions um, in, the, um, in the executive civil in the, in the public service, uh, should be able to actively participate in partisan politics, man phone lines, canvas, put signs on their property, express their views. And as I said, there may be some hard cases and there may be some difficult lines, but certainly it strikes me that in this case, the individual, given the kind of job he performs, uh, should have quite broad uh, scope to be able to engage in partisan politics. And you know, I'm sure they find objectionable his song, but it's not, it's not mean-spirited or anything like that. And uh, I, I think that, uh, I think that the, his superiors uh, have probably not properly respected the outcome of these, uh, the Osborne case and others. You know, Tony Turner is not one of my members. Um, but from a very personal perspective, I've, you know, reacted, knee-jerk reaction is, what does this song have to do with migratory birds anyways? Now, how can anybody point me to say his role as a public servant has been compromised, like his function and what he's supposed to do professionally has been compromised by his artistic, uh, art, by his art, artistic creation? for me, doesn't make any sense. And um, both from an artistic perspective as well as from a citizenship perspective. I mean, this man is a citizen of this country. He's been observing, uh, partly from within. But of course, his experience is unique to, the, you know, to Environment Canada. He doesn't speak of Environment Canada specifically in his song. Some, and I understand that some of the verses were written by others, some of them were written by himself, and I think this was all part of, again, being citizens, being observers, and you know, saying out loud what, uh, what we are seeing and what we are fearing. Um, and I think that is absolutely legitimate. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't see how this could impede his capacity to be a migratory bird researcher. Right. Uh, For sure it's a tactic. Everything this government does, if there's one thing that the conservative government is particularly good at, it's, uh, you know, 
tactizing strategically, uh, making sure that they're uh, well placed to um, to be reelected. I mean, really, that's the the goal, the only goal. We need to be reelected, uh, and if that means. Uh, you know, delaying, stalling, uh, even in some cases advancing uh, dates. They're perfectly willing to do it. I mean, they did that with this election. All of a sudden, they they doubled the normal election campaign period. That permits them to spend a whole lot more money, while at the same time they've imposed limits on everybody else, on all the third-party people. Uh, so it's certainly their number one tactic is to uh, change the rules. And, and the last thing you want to do is find yourself in the position that Tony was in, which is um, now I'm not in a position to complete my life's work on migratory birds. Uh, he had planned his retirement around the completion of this project. And so Tony wanted nothing more than just to get back to work, pay or no pay. This is not about pay for Tony. Uh, this was about getting a job done. And he wanted nothing more than to return to work. And unfortunately, where he found himself um, was not only unable to complete the work that he had so hoped that he would be able to complete, uh, really important research that ends up being the factual and evidence base for some future policy uh, about birds and our environment, um, found himself in the, in the very difficult position of uh, not being able to do that and not being able to express himself like every other Canadian citizen as a result of this lingering investigative and decision-taking process, which may come out post-election as, oh, turns out he did nothing wrong. In fact, that was my first instinct. Well, my goodness, clearly he's done nothing wrong. Clearly, you can't make the link between a uh, folk singing guy who spends his uh, personal time being active within the folk community in Ottawa and his work on mapping out migratory bird patterns. There's no reasonable person could make that link. And so Tony hasn't done anything wrong. Uh, I think this government knew that. I think that's why they sent him home with pay as opposed to without pay, because mm -hmm. they would be penalized greater after the fact when it's found that what they did was uh, was wrongful. Um, and, you know, as I say, uh, as wrong as it is, uh, you can bet it's been somewhat effective. It's discouraged others from speaking out in the way that they have the right to. The, the Department of Justice, as well as the department in which uh, Tony was working, I think he was in the environment, if I'm right. Each department was supposed to create its own uh, code of conduct or statement of values and ethics. And my department uh, at the time, the Department of Justice, did the same. And I remember commenting on it. And one of my comments had to do with the identification uh, in that code of our employer's interest with the government of the day. And uh, I, I still think that's, I thought at the time, and I still think that's conceptually a huge error. Doesn't mean that the public service should be hostile to the government of the day. But the government of the day fulfills a role within the larger state. And as long as they're fulfilling that role appropriately, they're entitled to the support of the public service working under their direction. But that doesn't mean that isn't equal to saying that our ultimate loyalty is to the government of the day. And I think both uh, the, the code adopted in the Department of Justice and the one adopted in environment seem to make that error. And so the codes, instead of serving the public interest, are skewed to serve the government interest, and those aren't the same. Well, that's what we're seeing increasingly in, not just in policy, but in legislation, generalities which become open to the interpretation of a, of a minister. How does this law actually apply and how can you apply it? And that's, that's a trend with this government. And it's, well, there are some extreme words I could use, but I'll just say it's really unhealthy for our democracy. 
in fact, uh, Tony's case goes right to that. Mm -hmm. Who cares whether it was right or wrong to send Tony Turner home uh, and not let him finish out his, his work on migratory birds? Um, let's just send him home anyways, because that's what we need to do to intimidate other public servants until the election uh, takes place and, and to silence them. It's funny because we've had these rights uh, since the establishment of the Canadian Charter and certainly since uh, they were uh, upheld in the Supreme Court ruling in 1991, and yet this is the very first time we've ever tried to use them, our membership, our professional federal public servants, uh, and suddenly it's a problem that we have them. Um, so just speaks to the importance, by the way, of exercising your rights while you have them, because um, otherwise it's very easy for somebody to come along and, and take them back from you. Uh, and so I think our, uh, thankfully our membership is getting that message, and they are standing up for themselves and they are participating um, politically and they're, they're, they're asking us to be involved in this way to make sure that we can make the change in government we need um, to put ourselves in the best position to, to deliver public services. All of our rights aren't really inherent. Um, someone at some point decided to try to codify them. After that, courts try to interpret them. And whatever we believe our rights are, we have to fight for them because someone else is going to interpret things differently. And it's usually a power struggle. So those with power are going to reduce the rights of those without power. That's throughout history. That hasn't changed in Canada in 2015. It's still here doing the same thing. So it's extremely important that we understand the state of our rights as defined by the courts and defined in things like um, rights documents, wherever they happen to be, um, even as defined in policy documents in a workplace. What are your rights? How far can you go? And it's important to understand that and always struggle to keep what you've got and to extend it. Because uh, I believe that truth and honesty and the freedom of, freedom of expression is extremely valuable. And it's only by struggling to maintain it and to extend it that we preserve it. And if we stop that struggle, it will be taken away. I don't think we've ever had complete freedom of expression. Every time we've... Freedom of expression is something that had to be fought for. Uh, everything from the right to vote, uh, which we didn't have because of property qualifications. You know, the, the England, the cradle of democracy, the 1830s, 1840s, they only had 100,000 people at the most who were able to vote. Um, the working class didn't. The poor didn't. Um, we didn't have the right to vote in Canada until we owned property. Women didn't have the right to vote. Uh, so the freedom of expression you know, went along with that freedom to, you know, to give voice. Um, so every chance to, you know, for freedom of expression had to be struggled for. Going back a hundred years, uh, workers didn't have that freedom of expression. They had to stand on street corners. Um, again, Joe Hill, the IWW, the socialists, having free spe speech fights, having music as part of that. And somebody would get on, on the soapbox and start windmilling and talking. And uh, so they were you know, telling them to organize into unions. And they were hauled off and they were thrown into jail. But little bit by little bit, we thought that we did win that right to freedom of speech. But freedom of speech is always tempered by whoever's in power and whoever controls wealth. So, yes, you can have freedom of speech, but you have to go to a newspaper. But who is the newspaper owned by? You go to the media. Who is the media owned by? You try to go to government, but you stand outside of parliament and you're not inside of parliament. Um, so where is that complete freedom of speech? It is something we aim for. That's hoping with the society we could have, but we're not there yet. The issue of freedom of expression, never mind just for federal public servants, for Canadians in general, uh, it's certainly been one that's been more and more uh, important under this government as it has slowly but surely shut down the avenues of all Canadians' um, freedom of expression, whether it's through C-51 uh, or it's through um, shutting down their ability to, uh, you know, come together, um, what, you know, uh, taking stock of anybody who might participate in a peaceful demonstration. I mean, I have to admit, as, as, as a union leader at this time, uh, 
even I at times have wondered, is my neck out there a little too far? Am I going to be targeted by this? And certainly the day I went into my local corner store and found myself on the front page of the Ottawa Sun with the tagline, why Harper should fear her, I actually thought to myself, oh my goodness, now I'm a little bit afraid um, because this government's record on people's uh, you know, democratic and charter protected rights to freedom of expression is just horrendous. And artistic expression absolutely has to be understood as kind of central to the kind of realization of self, but also the audience. I mean, uh, you know, we are, we are creative, imaginative human beings and rely on that to kind of shape thought, shape feeling, give life, you know, to who we are, to connect with other people. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, absolutely, artistic expression has to be of central significance um, and is certainly seen as a core dimension of freedom of expression and why we protect it. certainly was taken aback when, um, when, they, uh, when I was put on leave and, and they, they, you know, they accused me of writing the song and and performing the song as if that was somehow wrong to write a song about whatever I wanted to write about. I mean, I just couldn't believe that, that, that they would accuse me of that. They, they since sort of backed off on that and they sort of fo focused on the posting of it. And, but, you know, um, I, 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 I think it would be a mark of a, of a pretty rep uh, repressive and, supp and suppressed society if we didn't have an art form like music to express ourselves. I mean, it it's it, it binds people together. It's uh, you know, it's it's kind of our it's the soundtrack of our lives. This is very disturbing, and people are disturbed, and that's the thing. Grassroots all across Canada and beyond, mm -hmm. people are saying, "You're telling a singer songwriter, you're telling a musician what they can and cannot sing about." That is very troubling. And that is the slippery slope that ends up with political control of artists, <laughs> which cannot be a good thing. It just can't. That's not healthy. And, you know, this is, <laughs> it's, it is very worrisome. And it's the time now for people to say, this is not acceptable. Never mind all the generalizations. Never mind any of the high flung arguments about this and that. If a, political party can silence a musician or a visual artist or an actor, whatever, then we're in a lot of trouble. Our freedom of speech is definitely at risk in that case. And so in this case, Tony Turner represents all of us. Because if it's Tony today, <laughs> and then it's other artists, that's why repressive regimes always, the first thing they do is paint over all the murals, <laughs> right? and shut down the artists as much as possible. So it's very encouraging and healthy to see not just Tony, but now some of the other musicians also speaking out, saying, come on, people, time to wake up. There's not much time left. We have to make a change here because the direction that things are going is not acceptable. These are not our values. And we do not want to be living in a country where somebody can knock on your door and say, oh, you just sang a song that we don't like. You know, today you're suspended from your job. Tomorrow, actually, we have a little prison cell waiting for you while we investigate. Okay, Tony has been investigated for eight weeks now because he wrote a song. This should be really troubling to a lot of people. Now, as you say, we live in a world of sound bites where one second our attention is on this and now it's on something different and we've forgotten all about it. Let's not forget this one, though. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, you mentioned pride and concern, and I've, I, I, I feel both of those things. I have felt both, both of those things. <sighs> so proud of him. So proud of him. Yeah. Because, and it's partly because it's not his normal path, you know. He kind of fell into it by writing this, this really catchy tune. And, uh, you know, it's really put him in a position of having to stand up and be counted and I think he understands that and uh, and he's taken that on and, and it, it's just um, to me it's just amazing that he's been able to step up to the plate like that yeah I think he's I think he's a wonderful man it makes us feel the future's bleak and 
I just, I've never in my adult life felt uh, that the future was so, um, just seemed so at odds with the vision of Canada that I had grown up with and I had lived with most of my adult life. Um, we're, we, it's, we seem to be in a point, and maybe this is what really drove me to, to write the song, is that, you know, I think the government is sort of painting this picture of, it's, 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 it's encouraging people to, to feel these um, basic, in, base instincts of fear and selfishness and greed. I think that drove me to write a song like Harper Man so I could express how, how, how I feel and I think thousands, maybe millions of Canadians feel about uh, that direction and there is a better Canada out there and we just need to find it and we need our leaders to show us what that vision is. And, you know, we've had the good fortune in this country to have some people that have been able to articulate a totally different vision of how we can move forward in a really positive way. And that's what we want. And even though many Canadians have been silent <laughs> up till now, let's hope that this time around, and sparked by the energy of songs like Harper Man, let's hope that this time around, people take action and reclaim the country. Thank you for watching the pre-election preview edition of Harper Man, A Dissident Serenade. Look for the full production of the film in December. The feature-length movie will delve into the depths of the issues, social and political, facing Canadians in our time. As with the song Harper Man, our film will shine a light on the stark truth of the erosion of ethics and our treasured values as Canadians, while we uplift our audience with a renewed hope of a future without Harper Man. Thank you. Dancing of the past, a battle of lost and won. Some sing of their dreams of a new day in the sun. Some sing out for love, and some sing just for fun. But in the circle of song, we are one. Come join with me in the circle of song, the young and the old, the weak and the strong. Singing with one voice, though we may speak different tongues, in the circle of song we are one.